Over the past 35 years, the Final Fantasy franchise has been graced with some of the greatest characters in video games, and when looking at things as a whole, it's pretty amazing to see just how much that remains the case, even now, as shown by 16 out of the 128 characters featured in the 10th GameFAQ character battle debuting in Final Fantasy games. One of these characters, Tidus, would star in Final Fantasy X before then resurfacing during Final Fantasy X-2's perfect ending, and although he isn't everyone's cup of tea, the impact of his story and the importance of his sacrifice would resonate with a load of people around the world, reducing them to tears upon the game's conclusion. But even though there's a load of stuff people know about Tidus, such as the fact he was meant to have black hair, we thought it would be fun to delve a bit deeper into not just how the character came to be, but also some of the more fun nuances that exist relating to his gameplay and wider appearances. So, without much further ado, let's run through 7 facts about Tidus that we're pretty confident you didn't know, and we're going to start off with a crazy story about how Tidus' Japanese voice actor would end up being hired. Also, apologies in advance if me saying Tidus is triggering. I would often say Tidus, but as we're going to be talking about why it should be Tidus from a canonical perspective, it felt appropriate to at least remain consistent. So. Square had started using motion capture artists when working on Final Fantasy VIII as a way of improving the quality of their FMV sequences. Perhaps the most famous instance of this is the ballroom scene, but there are many, many other sequences that were also created using motion capture artists. The same approach was then used for Final Fantasy IX and X, with Square often using the same selection of motion capture artists. For example, Mayuko Aoki provided motion capture for Rinoa, Idea, and Zell's infamous crush, the library girl in Final Fantasy VIII, Garnett in Final Fantasy IX, and then Yuna in Final Fantasy X. Another actor called Masakazu Morita, who was at the start of their career, also worked on Final Fantasy VIII as a motion capture artist for Zell. And even though Morita was not rehired to work on Final Fantasy IX, he was brought back for Final Fantasy X as Tidus' motion capture artist. The fun fact here though, is that Morita would also end up voicing Tidus after Square failed to find a suitable voice amongst a huge raft of voice actors. According to Morita, who was speaking to Famitsu as part of the promotional activities surrounding the HD remaster, Square auditioned over 100 different voice actors, and after they couldn't find what they were looking for, they decided to give Morita a shot. He thought it would be a piece of cake, and as his audition was successful, that opinion would have held true, but after listening back to his audition, Morita realised his voice needed a lot of work, and he tried very hard to improve. This chance event, coupled with the fact that he had a load of fun working with his fellow voice actors, then led to Morita attempting to become a full-time voice actor, and not too long after, he would land the role of Ichigo, the main character in Bleach. As a weird turn of fate, Square Enix would also cast Mayoko Aoki as the voice of Yuna, and it meant the two motion capture artists for the lead characters in Final Fantasy X would also end up voicing them as well. Switching over to the English voice acting, James Arnold Taylor has become iconic due to the amazing work he did voicing Tidus, but what's interesting is that Square could have taken a very different route. Due to their ever-increasing focus on the big screen, Square had become somewhat familiar with the inner workings of Hollywood. It led to them gaining an appreciation for the value placed around who was hired in relation to a project, as the star power of actors could raise the profile of the project as a whole. Previous video games that had utilised voice acting had seldom taken heed of this, perhaps because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of budget. They had placed a focus on hiring specialised voice actors as opposed to celebrity actors, and it led to mixed results with the likes of Metal Gear Solid mixed up with some of the more prominent examples of less than savoury voice acting work from that time. When the decision was taken to have voice acting feature within Final Fantasy X, it was a pretty monumental step. Square had steered clear of this with the previous generation of consoles due to the sheer volume of effort required, but after the decision had been made, the initial plan was for them to adopt a similar approach to what they were taking with the spirits within, hiring well-known actors to raise the profile of the project and ensure the quality was high. Now it's unknown who would end up being cast in the role of Tidus, but Jack Fletcher, who was the voice director in charge of Final Fantasy X, shared with us many, many years ago that Square did actually have a celebrity lined up to play the role. However, after much deliberation, they decided to go in a different route, as they didn't want the characters to be overshadowed by the person playing them. Instead, they felt it would be smarter to have the character be the focal point so that the actor would become known for playing them. 
It led to the casting of James Arnold Taylor, who at the time was an up-and-coming voice actor, having appeared in shows like Johnny Bravo, The Powerpuff Girls, and SpongeBob SquarePants, but only voicing ancillary characters. And as Jack predicted, playing Tidus was career-defining for Taylor, with it being one of his most famous roles, even now, alongside Obi-Wan Kenobi and Ratchet. Now, such has been the level of popularity surrounding the characters voiced by James Arnold Taylor that there has been a load of intrigue around him as an actor. It's allowed Taylor's own YouTube channel to reach almost 100,000 subscribers, and over the years he's shared numerous nuggets of information, with one of them relating to how and why Tidus' name is said the way it is. When Final Fantasy X was released, even though it did contain voice acting, the developers still wanted to allow players to change the main character's name and it was for that reason that Tidus' name is never said within the game. However, as the franchise started to expand, Tidus would start to appear within external properties and they couldn't have the same restriction anymore. This naturally led to conversations internally at Square as to how the name should be said within the English versions, and according to Taylor, Tidus was chosen as when Final Fantasy X was being produced, they asked an American voice actor who was based in Japan how the name should be said, and he responded with Tidus. Not too long after, Tidus would appear within Kingdom Hearts, and the way his name was pronounced would be consistent with what the voice actor had recommended. But when Kingdom Hearts 2 released, they decided to switch, instead referring to the character as Tidus. Needless to say, this caused a lot of confusion, and has led to different portions of the fanbase feeling validated depending on the appearance of the character. But when Dissidia was released, Square Enix doubled down on the Tidus variant, and that's the one that's been used for all subsequent appearances. Now what's interesting about all of this, however, is within the Western release, Tidus was not the original name planned for the character. When the developers were building up the cast, there were many, many changes. Characters like Hayate, Kit, and Ryogu would end up being cut completely, despite only being revealed to the public in December 2000, less than seven months before the game shipped in Japan. But Tidus and Yuna were set in stone due to how integral they were to the story. As such, when they were being developed as characters, they were given purposeful names, and they both came from Okinawan, an indigenous language from the Japanese island of Okinawa. Playing on the classic usage of light and dark as a story mechanic, it would see the main character called Tida, which is the Okinawan word for sun. This is why his ultimate weapon, Crest and Sigil, would be related to the sun, and the original intention was for the name to carry over to the western version, just as many character names had carried over before in previous games in the franchise. In fact, the only real reason characters would have their name changed before this would be to avoid issues that wouldn't have existed within the Japanese version. Zidane, for example, was renamed in the French version to avoid association with the popular football player, and numerous characters in Final Fantasy VI were renamed as the names they were given for the Japanese version were far too common in the United States and would have broken the illusion of fantasy. Now, it's true that some Western journalists in the build-up believe that Tidus was meant to be called Tide, as even though it would be said Tida in Japanese, through localization, they believed it would be changed to play along with the weather theme of Cloud and Squall. But at the start of 2001, Square released some new footage of Final Fantasy X via their Play Online portal, and it featured the name Tidus. This decision, as well as that made by the aforementioned American voice actor, would end up causing over two decades of trouble. But unlike every other spoken name that's existed in the franchise, Square did not provide an immediate benchmark, and this decision led to people forming their own conclusions based on the semantic rules that work for their own specific languages. In English, for example, without any guidance, it will be natural to pronounce Tida as Tida, as it's a split digraph based around the letter I, and even though the word does not exist within the language, it will be a natural devolution of the word Tidal. Conversely, in German, just as it does in Japanese, Tida would make more sense based on their rules for how letters combine to make words. Now even though Tidus would see a lot of changes throughout development, such as his hair colour going from black to blonde and the plot device relating to him being dead removed completely due to the release of The Sixth Sense, according to Kazushigo Nojima, during the first half of the game he was by far the easiest character for the Snaro team to write. Nojima, who was the scenario writer on Final Fantasy X, revealed this nugget when speaking to Famitsu ahead of the release of the Final Fantasy X HD remaster, and his reason was quite simple. Because they made Tidus to be the representation of the player, a stranger in a foreign land who was oblivious to what was going on, all they had to do was think about what kinds of questions the player would want to be asking at any given situation. On the flip side, in the second half of the game, when Tidus became a bit more aware of what was going on, this became a bit more difficult as they had to try and figure out how to keep certain answers that Tidus craved at arm's length. 
but even this was nothing in comparison to how much they struggled to write Lulu. Due to who they were as people, both Nojima and Daisuke Watanabe found it a real challenge to get into the mindset of how a beautiful lady would think or live her life given the constraints of the world they had created. Each of the characters in Final Fantasy X featured elaborate and meaningful designs and to ensure everything was authentic, Square even worked with external designers on some of the characters. In the case of Tidus, Tetsuya Nomura designed his outfit so that it would stand out in comparison to the denizens of Spira, further emphasising that he didn't belong there. But there were some very subtle elements introduced that were great for marketing but also storytelling, and perhaps the most obvious is Tidus' necklace. Within the game itself, it was a prominent part of Tidus' attire and after launch, Square Enix released it as a standalone product due to its popularity. But what's not so well known are the reasons why the necklace was designed in such an eye-catching and unique way. Perhaps the most obvious part is that it matches the logo for the Zanuck and Abes, and from a narrative perspective this makes complete sense as Tidus was of course the star player. But Nomura, who designed the logo, also introduced some more subtle elements to the logo that aren't as easy to catch. As inspiration, Nomura revealed that he looked at numerous nautical elements such as fishing hooks, fish bones and whale fins as reference for its design. But outside of this having an influence on the texturing, the necklace also features two letters, with its shade designed to include a T for Tidus and a J for Ject, and both were taken from the Latin alphabet. What's very interesting about this is that it works in direct opposition to the rest of Spira as none of their languages use the Latin alphabet. And this was because the necklace had been designed before those languages had been established within the development and Nomura chose not to go back and amend his designs to accommodate for the additions. And that brings us on to our last fact, which relates to the hidden affection meter that exists within Final Fantasy X and how it affects Tidus. Much like in Final Fantasy VII, where characters could have their affection towards Cloud changed, in Final Fantasy X the same applied to Tidus. At the start of the game, it would see every character starting on a level playing field, but decisions taken in numerous cutscenes, as well as actions taken by Tidus during regular gameplay, would start to switch things around. This would change the outcome of a few different cutscenes, but perhaps the most intriguing consequence related to what happened at the end of Tidus' Blitz Ace Overdrive. Now, it's important to note that no matter how high Tidus' affection was towards Orin, Kimari, or Waka, a girl would always tee up the ball with Tidus, and the girl who threw the ball would then be determined by said affection level. But should no girls be available due to the party selection, or because they were KO'd or petrified, the ball would instead just come out of nowhere. What's also very interesting is that if the party was fighting underwater, even though Riku should have thrown the ball by default, as Yuna and Lulu would never be in the party, if her affection was lower than the other two female characters, the ball would still come out of nowhere. As a fun extension to this, when Dissidia released, it was possible for Tidus to square off against himself, and should that occur, he would say, I'm the one and only ace here. It would later be revealed in the Dissidia Ultimania guidebook that this would be a direct reference to one of the scenes from the original game that would be affected by the affection level, as towards the end of the game, no matter who jumped in front of Tidus, he would say, hey, star players first. And with that, I think we're done. They were seven facts about Tidus that we're pretty confident you didn't know, and as always, we threw in a load of little bonus facts for good measure. Having said that, we're pretty sure there are some amongst you who still knew them all. But let us know in the comments below which you found to be the most interesting, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Anthony Hoffman, Benjamin, the Livestream and Gregory, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching the video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.